And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to PreneurCast. You know, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Don Gosher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if we want to. Visit us online at preneurmarketing.com. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of PreneurCast. This is Dom Goucher, and Pete Williams is not with us in person again this week, but he has provided us with another one of his fantastic interviews. As we come towards the end of the year, Pete has got some great people to talk to, and this week it's no different. He's talking to a chap called Matthew Michalowicz. Now, I take full responsibility for getting that one wrong. As you'll notice, Pete Dodgers mentioning his name at all in the interview. Um... Matthew is a serial entrepreneur and author of Life in Half a Second. Now, this book is of particular interest to me, to Pete, and to, I would say, anybody listening to the PreneurCast podcast, anybody in the Preneur community at all, because this book is absolutely about the one true skill that we all need to master, and that is taking action. It's about deciding what you want to do and doing it just getting on and doing it and so that's what pete's going to talk to matthew about and that's what i want you to listen to and at the end of this well if you even make it to the end of this before you start taking action then well take action see you at the end michael thank you for your time oh uh, look a pleasure pete thanks for having me awesome so uh new books out which is very exciting and we'll uh definitely jump into that at some point but i thought you know like everything we should probably give it some context and i guess you know that context view is going to be quite deep with the successful businesses you've had and all that sort of fun stuff so um let's let's dive into sort of the start now you're obviously you're, you're polish by by birth is that correct yes yes yeah. and uh yes. kind of moved around quite a bit to sort of uh, end up here in uh australia yeah, absolutely. So before I became a serial entrepreneur, I uh, was a serial immigrant. <laughs> and uh, we escaped communism when I was a kid. I was about six, moved to New Zealand of all places. I think my parents wanted to get as far from the communists as uh, humanly possible, and they couldn't get further than New Zealand, which they yep. were very happy about. And then I was about 11 uh, when uh, we moved to the U.S., and I spent uh, most of my adult life and growing up there, uh, got married, and uh, and then about nine years ago moved to Australia with my wife. So that's uh, d- definitely a, a journey from uh, from Poland to New Zealand to the United States to uh, to Australia. Beautiful. Why Australia? Why why did you end up here? Uh, accidental tourists. My wife and I visited the country back in 2000 and just fell in love with it. We we believed at the time that it was just the best place on earth. We've lived here nine years had a couple of kids in that time and nothing has changed our view we just think australia is just amazing love every second of being in the country so it was nothing more than just being here and feeling fantastic loving the experience and thinking to ourselves boy we we, we want to experience that every day let's move here beautiful ah fantastic couldn't agree more obviously i spent a lot of time in the u.s and still love coming back home to australia it is definitely uh i agree the best place on earth Absolutely. There's nothing better than coming home, Pete, to, to a place you're really excited about coming home to. And that, that, for me, is definitely Australia. Love it. Very exciting. So, obviously, you know, throughout the journey in, in the US particularly, and obviously in, in, in Australia now, you've had a couple of different companies over time. So, what's that journey been like? What, why the entrepreneurial bug? Is it something that comes from your, your parents at all, or is it something that's just ingrained with you? Yeah, great question. My parents were actually both academics in communistic Poland. You couldn't really own anything. So, being an entrepreneur is, um, isn't really f- feasible or possible under a communistic regime. So it's definitely not family or, uh, or something that my parents did. It, it really uh, happened when I wanted to do something in college that I enjoyed doing and be paid well for it. And I think that's you know one, one of the secrets of happiness. If you do something you love and you're able to make a good uh, earning from it, you're going to be happy. And, and when you're young, there are very few, if any, opportunities. And I mean, by young, I mean, you know, 18, 19, the, the end of high school, the beginning of college. No one's going to pay you any significant amount of money to do anything that might closely resemble to what you enjoy doing. Most, most of the jobs are very menial, they're boring, they're repetitive, um, they're low paid, and they're usually not enjoyable jobs. So really, my decision to become an entrepreneur stemmed from, hey, I 
I want to make more than I'm making now in a job that I hate doing. And the only way I can do that is becoming an entrepreneur. And that's what I did. And that was the beginning of the journey. Yeah. Does anything, because I know you're, you're a huge fan of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And um, <laughs> it's because it, obviously, you know, this is something that I don't think a lot of people understand is how entrepreneurial he actually was when he first immigrated to um, LA with his mail order business and the real estate business and all that sort of stuff. So was there any, any of that at the time for you or did the love of Arnold come after? No, no, it actually came before. So when I was about 14, actually when I was eight, I began to see his movies by uh, sneaking into the movie theater and immediately became a fan that way. But it wasn't until I was 14 that I actually began reading some of his books like uh, uh, the Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding or the Education of a Bodybuilder. And I was struck about really by his drive to succeed. It was just incredible whether you see him speak or you read the material or you watch a movie like Pumping Iron. It immediately comes from him. I want to succeed. I'm driven to succeed. And this is what I do every day to succeed. So I was really taken by that at a young age. And obviously he's an immigrant, which I identified with. He's, it's a rags from riches story. And his journey, which many people, like you pointed out, don't appreciate, is not just in the movies. He's one of the few, if not only, people in the world that succeeded in a sport. He got to number one. He, well, he's a self-made millionaire through, like you said, mail order business, property investments. He went into business uh, classes at the university. And then he moved into show business and was the highest paid actor in the world. And then he moved into politics and had the highest office that he could possibly hold and uh, not being a, a naturally born U.S. citizen. So his achievement is extraordinary, and it's clearly something that he's doing that's just not luck. It's uh, some process he's following or, uh, or some formula that he's following. So that's why I've always been interested in what he's doing because he succeeds across so many different industries. Yeah, it's an incredible story, and I'm, I'm about halfway through Total Recall, his, uh, his audio book, or his, his book, but I'm yeah. listening to the audio version, and it's just surprising. I knew some of his success, or at least a little bit of understanding of his you know, real estate stuff and direct mail and things like that, but it's just an incredible story about just determination and, and work ethic and you know, you know, body, bodybuilding, lifting you know, four or five hours a day, going to night schools and acting class and you know, running the property. It's just incredible sort of you know, work ethic that he had to succeed. He just was, you know, juggling a lot of yeah. balls, but just worked his butt off. Absolutely. He wanted success more than anyone else, and he works more than anyone else to achieve it. And it's a, it's a great, beautiful story. Mm. So you, you had a bit of a bodybuilding background, I guess, off the back of your love of Arnold. Is that fair after you read those books you mentioned? Did you get into that mm. sort of world? Yes, that, ab absolutely. So I think, um, you know, every, every uh, boy growing up in, in the United States that is underweight dreams of uh, you know having a better physique having more muscles and and really my love of bodybuilding just came from that just improving the way you look being stronger being fitter and so on and and, and then you find that it's actually a very enjoyable discipline it's it's about goal setting it's about it's very individualistic so success or failure rests on your shoulders it teaches you really to be disciplined and committed to certain things so there were many things that i took out of bodybuilding that i enjoyed that were hugely applicable in the next 20 years that i did in business i mean the same type of principles and philosophies in terms of being determined in terms of doing it being disciplined doing it every day same kind of things were applicable and my first business that i had that i started when i was about 18 was a personal training business because the only thing I knew at the time and really enjoyed at the time was fitness and I, and I, and I could take someone that was overweight or that had some type of issue with the body in terms of uh, weaknesses etc and design a training program and a nutritional program to improve their situation so my love of the sport and really my desire to became, uh, become an entrepreneur merged at that moment when I was 18 and that's how I started very exciting. So was that basically uh, in North Carolina? Is that where that started? Yeah, yep. correct, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Beautiful. And then from there, so that was obviously, was it a, a big business? Did you Was it all more like sort of like your first sort of dip in the water and kind of just your few clients here and there and kind of just got a taste of, uh, you know, earning from a, off your own back and things like that? Or did it actually grow into something substantial? Uh, no, it definitely didn't become substantial as, you, as the later businesses did. The later businesses got to almost 200 employees. This one was still under 10 employees, but it did have employees, and it taught me all the basic mechanics of business. So, 
you know, employing someone, contract law, having insurance, what happens if you injure a customer, creating partnerships. I had to have uh, a place where I could train customers, so I had to have a partnership with the gym. Sales and marketing, how do you attract uh, prospective customers by making yourself visible? How do you develop credibility that a customer would actually engage you to train them? Um, How do you charge the right amount? All of those really uh, basic fundamental things that you have to know and to do in business, I really learned in that fitness business over a three, four-year period. But it never got to anything like the last few businesses that I've run. Yeah. Now, obviously, we'll get into the books because you've written quite a few since then. But, you know, being an immigrant son of, you know, educators, you know, there wouldn't have been a lot of mentorship at home, I'm guessing, to sort of help you get through those first three or four years. So what was it that sort of helped you kind of learn that stuff and and get an understanding of what it takes to actually grow a business and, you know, get clients and and hold clients and, you know, get to the point where you can have, you know, six, seven, eight, ten staff? Yeah, this is a really, really good question. And it comes down to just a simplistic thing that that I really, and and I call it desire, I really wanted to do something I love doing and be paid for it. And that drove me. And you're absolutely right. I didn't have a mentor. No one guided me. I didn't have anyone at home that said, hey, Matt, look, this is how you set up a business. Here's some money to do it. Go see this lawyer. Go see this accountant. This is someone to do your web. I I never had any of that. So it was this raw, animalistic desire. I want to escape this situation. I hate these menial jobs. They pay nothing. I hate what I do there. I want to do something I enjoy. And that desire drove me to seek knowledge. So I started talking to professors in, uh, in college, in the, in the business school. I began seeking out people that were entrepreneurs and that had succeeded at whatever level, even if it was a small level, to find out how do you set up a business? What's my first step? How do I do this? How do I do that? So it was really the desire to succeed that drove me every single day to fill in the knowledge gaps that I had to discover what is the path to becoming an entrepreneur. And it was really painful and difficult, but you know, if you want it bad enough, I got there in the end. Mm, absolutely. And then that sort of obviously parlayed into the, the first real success, which was New Tech. Is that correct? Co- correct. Correct. Uh, so, so what so was that the, business? It was a technology business. So before, in between the fitness business and New Tech, uh, I had graduated from college with a finance degree and had a money management company with another person that was an investment banker. And that grew, that was the first really substantial business in the sense that we were managing about $150 million in other people's money. And the reason we ended up selling that was because of the technology boom in the United States. You remember 98, 99, the, the, the tech explosion. So we sold that business and created the first really big company, which was New Tech. And it was about building enterprise software for optimizing really logistical processes, Uh, the the way trucks move around the United States, uh, the way you should move products from different destinations to optimize for cost or for other variables. And we raised a lot of our CEO. There were two other founders, the investment banker from my previous business, and, uh, and my father, who's a computer scientist. We incorporated the company. We raised a lot of venture capital, about $15 million, and we immediately began. And, uh, and the first thing that happened was that the stock market crashed and the tech uh, boom became a bust which make for a very interesting story for the next few years. Mm. So this is the, the intriguing thing, and this is what I think a lot of conversations with entrepreneurs skip over, and it always fascinates me. How do you go from being a college graduate to raising $150 million and becoming a, a money manager, and then from that move into a technology company which seems like in an area that you had no skills personally whatsoever in? Like, Correct. How, how does that actual journey go? That's an intriguing one which so many people, I think, gloss over in conversations like these. No, that's a fantastic point, Pete, and absolutely. My degree is in corporate finance. I've never seen a line of computer code, certainly (laughs) never written one, so you're absolutely correct in picking up that moving from finance into technology was not an area uh, that I had a background in. So, And and even the finance business, the, the key to it all is really surrounding yourself and being in business with people that are more successful than you. That's really the, 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 the trick to it. So when, when I had the fitness business, it was just me. But when I moved and graduated from college, the finance business was co-founded by a person that had 30 years of experience. 
He was one of my customers in the fitness business, so I developed a very strong relationship with him. And one day we came up with the idea, I think it was even at, at, at the gym, why don't we go into our business for ourselves in this area of corporate finance? And he had tons of experience, tons of contacts. He had credibility. He was able to bring money to the table, and off you go. So it, it, it is always in business if you can team up with someone that complements your weaknesses or is even ahead of where you are, you've got a much greater chance of success. Mm. So then after the money management business, that earned um, some – uh, some runs on the board for me as an entrepreneur. The next business, new tech, moving into technology, the person that we brought into that equation was my father. And he had written 400 research publications, 40 books in this specific area of optimization. He had enormous amounts of credibility. He had created uh, unique technologies in the university setting. And he brought all of that credibility with him into the company and combined with me and the investment banker, which now had a track record from the money management business, that became a very attractive package for investors to come and back. Mm. But, it, it, but if it was just me, I mean, you picked up on it very quickly. If I had created the fitness business and then I said, you know what, I want to become a money manager, <laughs> it, 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 it'd be tough. It'd be really tough because yep. you've got no track record. You've got no one knows you from a bar of soap. But if you team up with an established money manager, everything's easy then you, or easier. And then when you move into technology and it's two money managers and now they want to become technologists, same story. No one's mm -hmm. going to back these guys because they don't know anything. But then you introduce into the picture someone that knows backwards and forwards what they're doing. People follow them. They've got a track record. They've got a following. Again, everything is now easier. Yeah. So that's that. That was the secret. Well, this is this is the other thing that intrigues me about this story is obviously going into that next business with your father. There's probably three things that stack up that most people would say avoid. One is obviously you know your father, with all due respect, coming from the sort of communist background. You know, now becoming an entrepreneur would be a, a big shift because obviously you being young, you wouldn't have really been, I'm guessing, as affected by that regime Correct. as they would have Correct. been. Going into yes. business with, with family is always a, a tricky one. And also then going into business with a long-term university professor, like going from that sort of mentality of I'm a, I'm a university professor to now being on the ground, getting dirty as an entrepreneur, there are three, <laughs> you know, almost like strikes against you before you started. How was that? Yeah, very, very good point. <laughs> when people have, I mean, you, 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 all of your observations I think are spot on, and I think it's important, I live by this mantra, that you've got to define your roles uh, as founders of a business early on. I think it would have been really challenging for my father to come into new tech and, and for us to tell him, right, you've got to be CEO now, you've got to go and raise money from investors, and, and then we want you to pitch to customers, and we want you to do this and that, because he doesn't have really skills to do any of those mm -hmm. things, or a background or training or experience or anything else for that matter. His real strength is he knew the technology, and he was highly credible on a world scale around that technology. So we said, right, we want you to become the chief scientist of the company. Your role is really to build the technology, build a portfolio of IP. We're going to raise money, and we want you to recruit some of the best people in the world, which he did. He recruited 20 PhDs that became employees in the first year that were world class in this particular area. And when we put him in front of investors, all he talked about was his particular domain, which he knew backwards and forwards, and he was really passionate about. So you've got to put people in roles that they can perform and exceed, are comfortable in, and have kind of the background um, prerequisite knowledge and experience to do, rather than pulling someone from some setting like academia, putting them into entrepreneurship and say, right here, now you've got to sell, now you've got to raise money, they, they, they would fail. Mm. And this is the thing, so you, the business grew very successfully, you had clients like I think it was Ford Motor Company and Correct. Bank of America, and then you obviously, as you mentioned, the whole boom bust of the, uh, the good old tech bubble, um, you end yeah. up having an exit though just through an off-market off sale, is that how the exit of that business finished? Correct. The, the, for me and my father and some of the investors that came in early into that business, we were bought out by venture capitalists that wanted to continue. And those venture capitalists continued for a couple more years and they ended up selling the company to Natiza. 
and the teaser was end, ended up being bought by IBM Global Services. So, so even today, there's 60 or 70 ex new tech people working inside of IBM around the world, around some of their advanced technologies, predictive modeling, and so on. So that was the whole journey there. And it was very, very difficult. You know, when you raise money in 99, it's easy. People call it the disco days in the United <laughs> States, where you could have an idea, draw a picture on a napkin, people throw money at you. They got excited about everything and anything. And then when the bust happened, all of a sudden, gee, you need a real business now. You know, you need revenue, and Funny you need that. customers, and you need profit things that people forgot all about in 98, 99. So even though from 2000 to 2003, the business grew every year in revenue, it attracted world-class customers like Department of Defense or General Motors, Ford Motor Company, Bank of America. It was harder and harder to raise money because the investor sentiment was shifting away mm -hmm. from technology and so on. So it was a really interesting experience about what drives investor inflow into businesses and it's not the things you might think it is well even now i think there's this you know some really weird things happening over in silicon valley at the moment some of the like the obviously what facebook paid for instagram and yes. just some of the re real weird valuations i think what was it um mm -hmm. snapchat i think recently got like a ridiculous offer that they turned down it's just like there's no revenue it's, i just personally can't understand how you know, people who I would think are smarter than me are willing to throw crazy money at some of these things just because they've got users, not because it's actually making a dollar, but I guess it's a whole it's separate conversation. Like it's, yeah, Pete, it's almost like people are willing to pay exorbitant amounts of money on the future hope mm. that, uh, that this will be monetized, it will turn into revenue, and ultimately earnings per share in public companies, which is what, you know, drives stock values. Yeah, it's, I just think some of the valuations, like, it's ridiculous, but that's it's, it's beside Agreed. the point. And I'm guessing it was this time when you, you took that holiday and uh, fell in love with Adelaide? It was a little bit, I mean, when the t it was in 2000. So NewTek was created in 99. I ended up selling out at the end of 2003. And the holiday was around uh, December in 2000. So it was a lovely time. I remember being in Australia, and I don't think we saw a drop of rain. Yep. The whole time that we were here, it was just it was absolutely lovely. So it was definitely during the New Tech days. And when we sold out of New Tech, that's when we decided to move. Beautiful. And uh, how long do you sort of enjoy the wine country that is Adelaide and uh, all that sort of uh, beautiful hospitality and um, food that's produced in that region before you decide to uh, let's do something else and, and start the next company? Oh, it was a year and a half from exiting from New Tech before incorporating the next company. And in, in that year and a half, uh, we spent six months traveling to different places we had wanted to see around the world, like Beautiful. Easter Island or the pyramids in uh, in Egypt, things that you were, were always on the list that you wanted to see, do, touch, and uh, didn't have time to do. And when we settled for the year that we were in Adelaide prior to incorporating the next company, we definitely enjoyed it very much. It's, it's, <laughs> it's beautiful. The hills, Barossa Valley, McLaren Vale, the beaches, yeah. all of that's lovely. Plus, the people are fantastic. We, we uh, had a couple of kids during that time. I wrote a couple of books. It was really a great time to relax, refresh, and then set off on the journey again. So yeah, this new journey, what, what, what was that? Another IT company? Yeah, it, it was. Uh, the name of the company was Solvit Software, and it was really the successor to New Tech in the sense that we, we thought there was an enormous opportunity in big enterprises to improve what they're doing through better decisions. It's, 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 you know, every outcome you get in business is driven through decisions that you make. And because big companies have lots of complexity, lots of moving pieces, it's usually difficult for people or even computer systems to analyze all of that complexity on almost a real-time basis and recommend to a person or a business, do this if you want to minimize cost, maximize revenue, maximize market share, and maximize the amount of iron ore you put onto a ship, for example. So we wanted to do it again, but in a more focused manner. I brought over some people from the United States. My parents relocated to Adelaide. We incorporated this new company, Solvit Software, and it became uh, a very focused vehicle of doing the same thing, but in specifically the area of supply chain. So it was much more focused than new tech. We actually built an application for the sector versus new tech was more of a solutions provider. And we did the whole thing again with two significant differences. One, there were no investors, so we funded it ourselves, and yep. it was a much more enjoyable experience because no one was telling us what to do. Yep. We weren't 
meeting with investors every month and having pressure applied to us because they wanted to see this happen or that happen. We were able to do it at our pace and make our own decisions. That was a great experience. And the second was this area of focus. We weren't doing everything for everyone. We were specifically focused in an area, and we productized that area to the best of our ability. There was always customization and, and that development required for each deployment, but it was focused and it was easier to sell because of that focus. Very cool. Did you find doing business in Australia a lot different to the US? Yeah, definitely, <laughs> on, on all dimensions. I mean, from in the United States, probably the biggest immediate difference is there's so much noise in the U.S. The competition for everything is so high. You know, I mean, look at something like a consumer service like banking. There's four main banks in Australia and maybe 150 total banks and credit unions. In the United States, there's 11,000. And that goes for every single industry. There's so much competition, so much noise, that when you start a business in the U.S., you are immediately competing with an enormous array of people and businesses. And my immediate observation about Australia and Adelaide in particular is that competitive environment was much weaker, and in some cases it didn't exist at all. So I found business easier in the sense because in the United States, if I had begun solve it, I would be immediately day one competing with all of these other companies, which frankly, they, they weren't in Australia and they weren't interested in conquering Australia. So I had all this breathing room that I wouldn't have had in the US. Very cool. And obviously, again, that, you know, that, that story is a very similar one. It grew successfully, number of clients, number of employees, and then an exit last year or this year? How, how, how last long year. ago? Last year, yep. It's about, a, about a year and a half ago, it grew to almost 200 people. Uh, almost 20 million in revenue. It was. Uh, it became Australia's third fastest growing company. It really specialized in uh, optimization software for supply chains, mostly in mining. That's where the majority of revenue came yeah. from. Perfect and timing. Were like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Who would have thought that mining would do a 180 since then? But uh, Schneider Electric bought it uh, halfway through last year to integrate it with their other software services and products that they have. Very exciting. So are you still involved in the business or are you off now looking at new, new projects? No, no, no. I've left and uh, there's two main reasons for my departure was one, I had really given up a lot of family time, especially in the last two years of Solvit. I traveled about five days a week and I'm always a, a you know, family first type of guy and it was painful for me having kids growing up at home to not be there when you want to be there. Mm. So I made a commitment, look, I, I really want to be at home. And the second is the closest thing to my heart, closer even than entrepreneurship is writing. So, uh, so this was an opportunity to be at home, be with the kiddies, take them to school, pick them up, and in between that time, write the next book, which is what I've spent really the last year on. Yeah, and that's what, life in half a second. Correct. Yeah, Correct. It's a fantastic book. So let's get into that. So do you want to give a bit of an overview rather than me doing a hatchet job of my summary? No, no. <laughs> yeah, the easiest way to introduce it is that when I became an entrepreneur, I really got interested in the subject of success because there's so much at stake when you're an entrepreneur. I mean, your house could be on the line, your ability to feed yourself or your family. You know, the, the, the stakes are so much higher than just being an employee in a company. Because when you're an employee, the worst that can happen is you lose your job. When you're an entrepreneur, the worst that could happen is you actually go bankrupt. You lose mm. everything you've got. So the stakes are higher. And when I got interested in the subject of success, I started reading success books, attending seminars about success or entrepreneurship or what it takes to grow a business. And I quickly discovered that all of the material, about 99% of the material that I was exposed to was somebody else's opinion. Mm. So that, that no matter how successful someone is, they write a book or they give a talk about how they achieved success with the implication that you should do the same thing if you want to get to where they are. And, and the, the fault with that is that their advice might be completely unapplicable to your situation. They lived in a different time, in a different country, they were in a different industry, uh, things could have, been, could have been different social values at the time, different economic factors, and so all of a sudden you're getting this advice that is very contextual to a certain person's opinion, perspective, and time period, and you don't get the same results. In fact, what you read might not even apply to your situation. So I began studying at an early age, are there things that are really scientifically proven to aid 
or increase the probability of achieving success. Not opinion, not uh, people's observations, but things that have been studied in universities or organizations that you can apply as an entrepreneur to give you an edge. That's kind of the, the genesis of the book. And that happened about maybe 20 years ago that I began getting interested in the subject because, surprise, surprise, I want to succeed. And so 20 years later, when, when I, I've been collecting research studies, I've been talking to people, I've had this, you know, almost room full of notes and references and all of these different things I had been exposed to in terms of studies and papers I had read. And when I left Solve It, it was my opportunity to compile all of that into an easy-to-read book that distills success into five fundamental factors that anyone can apply that are universal. It doesn't matter if you read them today, a hundred years ago, a hundred years into the future. It doesn't matter if you're a sports uh, um, person or if you're in show business or you're an entrepreneur or you want to improve your career. I believe these are the five fundamental factors that drive success. And, that, and that's really what I distilled into this book, Life in Half a Second. Very cool. And it's it definitely a professor's son because as, as you read through the book, there's a lot of footnotes referencing all the research. So it's clearly not an opinion-based book. It's definitely a, a professor's son's book, but not, a, not in a dry professor way. I better, better clarify that because I do encourage people to you know, head over to Amazon and, and, and places like that to get a copy of Life in Half a Second. So let's actually talk about some of those five principles because sure. that's kind of the, as you said, the, the breakdown of the book. You actually, each sort of section of the book covers a different one of these five principles. So that, I'd love to sort of touch on, you know, some of them, if not all of them, if we have the time to sort of talk about how they can be applied to entrepreneurship or bodybuilding success in sport, as you kind of alluded to then. So so, so what are they? Let, let's go through some of those. Yeah, absolutely. The beginning of the book and really the beginning of any journey begins about having clarity around where the destination is, where are you actually trying to go. And I've, I've taught unbelievable classes uh, over, over the last 10 years. I've maybe taught, I don't know, 10,000 entrepreneurs through different programs, whether it's universities, whether it's government programs, whether it's my own mentoring programs and so on. And I found that most entrepreneurs or people that I meet think they have clarity about where they're heading, but really, in fact, they're very unclear. And they use terms like, I want to be a market leader, I want to have a profitable business, I want to be successful, I want this or I want that. And they think that those terms represent, you know, some form of destination. And really, clarity is about having very specific, precise goals. So instead of saying, I want to raise capital, you've got to say, you know, look, I need $5 million in institutional money nine months from now. That all of a sudden, you're saying the same thing. You need money, but you say it in a very specific, goal-oriented manner. Instead of saying you want to improve your margins, you say, I want to lift my margins from 10% to 18% 12 months from now. Every single statement has to be expressed in numbers, and it has to have some kind of date by which you try to achieve it. And the reason that that is so important through all these studies that I read is not that some magical process takes place when all of a sudden you know you write it on a piece of paper and the tooth fairy is going to deliver it to you one day it's not a magical process it just focuses your mind on what you're trying to achieve it's it's it's, it's as simple as that if you define exactly where you're going then you start walking through each day looking for people events information material that will help you get there. But if you wake up in each morning and you've got no clear sense of direction, where you're heading or what you want to achieve, then everything looks the same. Everything is noise. Everything has, has the same kind of look and feel to it. So the journey begins with having clarity about where you're going. And without that, nothing makes sense. No book is going to help you. No amount of reading or material that you put into your head is going to help you. You have to define the destination that you're trying to get to. Mm. So let me ask you this, though. For I think a lot of people, you know, you kind of alluded and spoke about noise in, in the sense in the, in the United States. For a lot of people, there is a lot of noise out there of opportunities and what to do and where to go. And you get bombarded with whether it's sales letters or TV commercials or movies of, I want to achieve it all. I want to do it all. I want to do this. Like, how do you actually distill and work out, okay, what is important to me? How do, how do you get that clarity and that clear well, the clear clarity, I guess, is probably the, the, the term to use. Uh, but look, you're absolutely correct. Think about just the average person's day, whoever you are. 
you wake up in the morning, you might watch the news, check emails, send text messages. If you've got a family, you might have to prepare your kids for school. You make breakfast, then you get ready for work. You might pack material. You might have to send a few more emails. You commute through traffic. You listen to things on the radio. You interact with people at work. You have meetings. You have lunch. You might do fitness activities after work or hang out with your mates at the pub. Think about all of the interactions, all of the stuff that happens in each particular day, how do you actually decide what is relevant and what is, irre- what is noise? The only way you can do that is if you've got clear, precise goals. So all the time, you know, and, every, and, and I write about this in the book, in everything I try to achieve, I write out exactly the one-year goal and I write out the things I need to do almost month by month or quarter by quarter to get me to that goal. And then as I interact with people, and I have an enormous amount of interactions every single day of my life, I can immediately discern, is this conversation relevant to my goals or not? And this is the critical distinction. So all the time people approach me and say, Matt, can you be an advisor to my business? Matt, are you interested in investing in what I'm doing? Matt, can you do this and so forth? And when I tell them no, I tell them, look, it's no reflection on what you're doing. I'm not saying no because I don't think what you're doing is good. I'm telling you no because what you're doing is not aligned to my goals. And that is a crit, and they, they get very surprised. And, and, and not in a bad way, but the fact that I'm so clear about what I'm trying to achieve that I can tell them straight up in a conversation. I don't even need to think about it. I can tell you right now, no only for the reason that what you've just proposed has no bearings on the goals that I've set myself for the next year or two years. And that's the key, the beginning, really, to achieving something. You've got to walk through each day and through all of those interactions and all the noise that you get exposed to. You've got to be able to pull out the signals that are relevant to what you're trying to achieve. If you can't do that, you can't move forward. You can't break through. Mm, I, I completely agree, and we talk uh, about that sort of stuff on the show here quite a bit in, in the term or the context of filters. You need a filter to work out yes. what it is and what's not right for your exactly. business or for you. And do you, do you think it's important to have this, this goal list for your personal life and a separate list for your business life and really definely and distinctly see them as two separate lists, or do you think they should be blurred together? Uh, different people treat that in different ways, and there is even if you have two separate lists, there is a relationship between the two lists because you only have so many hours in each day. Mm. So if in your personal list you put goals like I want to get in shape, I want to lose weight, I need to be spending more time with my kids or my spouse, um, I want to be reading books at night, all of those are fantastic personal goals, fantastic and I love them. However, they will take away from the time that you can spend on your business. So there is some innate uh, trade-off between, you know, you've only got so many hours, how are you going to spend those hours? And you've got to decide, and this is where the later chapters in the book of life and half a second come in, you've got to decide what is the most important thing to you. So you've only got one hour to spend. Are you, is it more important for you to spend that hour pursuing a professional goal, whether it's lifting weights in the gym, whether it's uh, uh, building a following uh, online in social circles, whether it's actually in your business making the next sale or is it more important for you not to miss out on the special years of your kids as they grow up and spend it with them to the possible detriment of your professional you have to you can't have it all you Mm. have to choose so people might create separate lists which i think is great however there is a a trade-off between those lists because time is not unlimited and you know that's why the book is called life in half a second we've only got a short period of time and we have to choose how we spend it Mm, absolutely, and I think they touch on that quite a bit at the start of the book too about the whole, you know, you, the life is really half a second when you actually look at the time that, you know, history has been and how long we've actually been on this earth for and really if you break it down, it is a very, very small piece of time in, in the history of the earth. So once, once you get that clarity, then it's desire is the next thing to really have that desire to believe in that, that choices you've made and follow that through. Is that kind of the, the next? Yeah. 
The Pardon? desire for goals is really the filter on, and I love the word that you speak, filter, it's a really strong word. It, it filters the importance of your goals or it allows you to rank them. So why is it that, you know, every year people set New Year resolutions like losing weight or do other things and they fail in those? You know, 80% of those New Year resolutions never get accomplished. The reason for that is that they don't really desire those things. And by desire, I'm talking about that kind of want where you wake up in the morning almost shaking and on fire jumping out of bed and saying you know what I have to do I want it so bad that I'm jumping out of bed on a Sunday morning to continue working on it most people don't have that for the goals that they set it's a nice to have gee I'd love to have a promotion I'd love to be a little bit thinner so I can get into my old clothes I'd like it, 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 it's a, a, a nice to have Whereas the things that you are so passionate about and, and you want them so badly, you're more likely to achieve those things because you put more effort into them. So the whole second chapter of the book is about filtering the goals that you've set. Because some goals sound great, but unless you're going to work your ass off to achieve them, it's never going to happen. Look at Schwarzenegger. Mm -hmm. Look at what you said at the beginning. He worked four to five hours a day at the gym. Who would do that? Who would do that? Only someone that really wants it and they want that success above any other success in their life. So that is what the second chapter is. You have to rank and filter the goals that you've set by your internal, personal desires for what's important in your life. And it's different for everybody. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, Schwarzenegger is the perfect the perfect person to use as the, uh, the pin-up boy almost uh, for this type of thing. So obviously I don't want to give the whole book away. I want to sort of, you know, really encourage people to head over to Amazon or wherever it might be and grab life in half a second. But can you touch on the, the remaining sort of two or three yeah, keys really another, quickly to get a bit of a taste it, test it, for people? It, it, look, my passion in life is really helping others. I mean, that's the thing I enjoy most. And I love hearing from readers about how they like a book. But, you know, what really makes my day is hearing from readers about how they applied the book. So I'm going to be launching next month a free video series where I coach uh, readers or just even people that haven't read the book about how to apply these principles. Awesome. So I'm happy to share. It's not about uh, selling uh, uh, more copies and you know uh, making money off selling a $20 book. It's about helping people and taking the knowledge you've had and trying to make an impact in other people's lives. And you know, to that end, one of the most important concepts in the book, and this is getting into the, to the third part, is that whatever you're trying to achieve, let's just say you've got a great goal, you want to be an Olympic athlete, you want to be an entrepreneur that has a business with certain uh, financial metrics, you're doing what you love and you're getting paid for it, uh, whatever the goal is, it doesn't matter, the easiest way to help you get there is to start spending time with people that have already gotten there. And there's many reasons for that. So think about, for example, you're sitting at home, you're in a job you don't like, you're one of those statistics where they do studies on unhappiness and they find how many people are unhappy in their jobs. And you want to, and you think to yourself, I want to become an entrepreneur. That's my goal. I want to create a business. I want it to have such and such revenue and such and such profit. And I, and I, and I want it. I really, really want it because I'm frustrated where I am in my life. That's fantastic. You've got the first two things down pat. Now, the easiest way for you to make the first step is meet people that are already there. Start spending time with entrepreneurs that already have businesses at whatever scale, doing something that they enjoy doing, and are getting financially rewarded for it. Because the moment you start spending time with those people, your belief will go up that you can do it as well. All of a sudden, you meet these people, they're just like you, and gee, they're doing something they love, and they're making a whole lot more than me, I can do what they do. Your belief immediately goes up. And what these people also do is they tell you how they did it. You have questions. I mean, this is how I started out at the beginning. I didn't know anything about business. So what do I do? I meet people that are in business. And I, and I say, what did you do? How did you start? What was your first step? And they tell me, and I say, wow, that's amazing. Well, how did you do that? How did you figure this out? And then they tell me. So it is critical, and if I could leave you know, listeners with one piece of advice out of this whole interview, it is that whatever your goal is, make it your mission 
to start spending time with people that have achieved that goal because you'd be amazed what will happen in your acceleration towards that goal. You're going to figure out how it's done and you're going to start believing that you can do it because you're around people that are helping you believe and are educating you. Mm, absolutely. So is there any other sort of major elements from the book that we should uh, cover before we wrap this up? The, the last thing that I, that I want to say, and this is where you know, the, the vast majority of people fall over is they read a book like Life in Half a Second, they go to a seminar, they listen to an interview like this, they get excited. They think, you know, it's fantastic. I want to do something. This is awesome. I want to do something. And then routine grabs them. They go back to what they were doing before, the emails, the daily life. You have, nothing you read or listen to is going to make any difference in your life unless you actually take action, unless you act on it, unless you do something. It all just becomes memory. It becomes extra information in your brain. So the difference between someone that actually moves towards goals and achieves things versus the person that doesn't is that the person that is moving is actually acting. So I encourage any listener to actually act. If you're inspired at this moment, act. Do something different in the next five minutes, in the next five days, rather than it just being another memory of another interview or another book that you might have read along with the thousands of others. Absolutely, I could not agree with you more. And I think the first place to start is sit down, get a pen and paper, and you know, really get clear on that, those desires and and that clarity that you know this is the stuff I really desire to do, and this is what the filter is going to be for me for the next six weeks, six months, six years, whatever it might be for you to give you that motivation to start acting and moving forward. Absolutely, Ab- do it. Don't Beautiful. think about it. The people that really want things, do it. The people that you know, sort of want things or they're not sure they talk about doing it. So be a doer, you know, and and like you said, doing is getting out a piece of paper right now and a pen and writing down where you want your business to be in a year, where you want your personal life to be in a year. That's doing. You're now physically doing something rather than just, you know, turning off this interview and going on about your life. Mm. And, and do it as a draft. Give yourself some freedom. This is what I always say to people, and I love your, your thoughts on this, is that you, know, you don't have to come up with your, your next six months worth of desires in the next five minutes. Just do a draft version of your desires. Of like, This is the stuff I'm thinking that I, I might be wanting to do, but then you can actually get clarity and, and you know, marinate on that for a couple of days, think it through, and then you know, by the end of the weekend or this time next week, go, yeah, okay, I've edited this down, I've added some stuff, I've taken some stuff away, and I, I really feel that burning agreement with this list. Agreed. Agreed. Such good advice, Pete. I mean, many people are afraid of taking out a pen and paper because they think it's permanent. They think that whatever they write down in the next 30 seconds or the next 30 minutes is forever. It has to be perfect. You know, we change. Life changes. Everything is constantly in flux. And and whatever you write down, you're going to reflect on it, marinate on it, just like you said. You might change it a few months from now, and then you know what? Your situation might change. You might get married. You might have kids. You might move to another country. Goals aren't static. They change, and it's perfectly normal for them to change. But the point is you need goals. Don't wait for some perfect time in the future to do it. Do it now and change it. Perfectly okay, rather than deferring and delaying. Completely agree. Well, uh, Matthew, thank you so much for your time today. Really do appreciate it. Life in Half a Second is the latest book. There's been a few other ones which I would love to have spoken about, um, particularly winning credibility because I think that's an interesting topic. So we might have to get you back on at some stage to talk about one of your older books. Uh, It would be a pleasure, Pete. Thank you so much for having me. So there you have it, folks. What a great interview. What a fascinating story Matthew has and what great insights into that biggest problem that I think so many entrepreneurs face, which is actually getting down to it and taking action. So Pete and I recommend that you go grab a copy of Matthew's latest book and just get on with it. As we come to the end of 2013, we're coming into 2014. Now is the time. Work at it, what it is you're going to do next year. Get on and do it. Thanks again for listening, folks. We'll be back with you soon. In the meantime, do check out preneurmarketing.com and specifically preneurmarketing.com forward slash win uh, where you can, as usual, win stuff from people that we've had on the show or just just generally stuff we've been sent. Um, 
Also, you can check out back episodes of the PreneurCast podcast and get the transcripts, which you can read or download. You can download episodes and you can leave us a comment either below each episode or you can use a little audio feedback widgety thing on the side of the site. And we love getting your feedback. So do take a little bit of time and let us know what you think of the show, what you would like to hear more of or less of. Uh, you can also also leave us feedback on iTunes. Uh, just go look for PreneurCast on iTunes if you didn't get this uh, episode from there, if somebody sent it to you. And also, as always, feel free to let your friends know about PreneurCast, whether you share the website or you let them know through iTunes. We love getting new listeners. And if you are a new listener, especially drop us a comment and just let us know what you think of the show. With that said, folks, we will see you all again soon. You've been enjoying another fine episode of PreneurCast with Pete Williams and Dom Gocher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at www.preneurmarketing.com or drop them a line via PreneurCast at preneurgroup.com.